Will Panasonic introduce time of flight to the GH6? Will they add an APS-C camera? Are they having production problems? All this and more. Let's get into it. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. Hi, I'm Simon and this is The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, subscribe to get notification of new videos as they come out. And all the links to everything I talk about in this video, including gear, are placed in the description down below. I've been searching for news updates on the Panasonic GH6 and other products that Panasonic may be working on, but very little is leaked out. So instead of leaks, I want to focus this video on understanding Panasonic's vision and direction to see what nuggets of information I can find. Recently, PhotoRent interviewed Yusaki Yamani about the future of Panasonic's Micro Four Thirds and Full Frame cameras. Yamani is Panasonic's Imaging Business Division Director. He conveyed Panasonic's vision and purpose for its Micro Four Thirds and Full Frame cameras. Yamani is confident in market growth. He believes that the full-size hybrid camera market will show growth over 2019 numbers, despite the current global downturn. But he does see a decline with a compact and SLR camera segment. I'm not so confident in his 2020 predictions, but I'm not sure anyone can accurately see the outcome of 2020. But Panasonic does view the market in two separate segments. The first segment is all about mobility. All decision that goes into the camera, how it is designed, is based around that principle of mobility. The other segment is all about delivering the best possible photo and video capabilities and experience. Panasonic, like most companies today, sees video and photo as equals in a world that used to focus mostly on photo with some video capabilities. Micro Four Thirds based cameras, like the GH6, are designed for customers that value mobility. The S series of full frame cameras are designed for customers that want the best photo and video experience. And if you're interested in the S1, Amazon has it on sale right now. I've got the link in the description down below. But back to Panasonic's understanding of the basic requirements. Yamani says the basic requirements of a camera for a photographer are its small size, lightness, and mobility. I'm not so sure I believe that. I'm not so sure he does either. I wonder if he meant something else. Lumping all photographers into a single group is risky, and I don't believe that's what he's trying to communicate. Maybe it's something in the translation. The S1R is designed primarily for photographers, but hardly lightweight and small. It's rigid and durable, and a high-end photographer's camera. But there's a certain beauty and elegance to their Micro Four Thirds cameras. They're compact, as are their lenses. They travel well, and the camera is hardly noticeable hanging around your neck. The same cannot be said for full-frame cameras. Micro Four Thirds cameras like the GH5 are great for ordinary film. I was going to say filmmaker are great for ordinary photographers and deliver good results for most scenarios. Autofocus being the exception and hopefully updated in the GH6 to use their time of flight focus system that they've been developing on for years. We keep hearing about this from time to time, and the last time we heard about it was in 2019. 43 rumors said that Panasonic is working on their time of flight sensor from the Vivo Next Duo phone to implement in a revised form in their Micro Four Thirds line. As this was quoted last year, it gives us some hope that it will debut in the GH6, which is rumored to be announced late this summer. The next question is how important is the Micro Four Thirds segment? Yamani addresses this saying, our strategy is very clear. We will strengthen the Micro Four Thirds mounts and the L mount in full frame. A small L mount sensor could cause confusion in the market. We have two sizes of sensors. If we have three, this could cause confusion, so we won't develop an APS-C version of the L mount and we'll focus on full frame. Panasonic has no interest in developing an APS-C camera, and why would they if they're getting great results from the GH5? It performs as well as an APS-C in low light and provides good detail. The only capability holding them back, in my view, is the contrast detect autofocus. Yamani goes on to say that they will improve the functions and quality of their Micro Four Thirds ecosystem. Please wait for future developments. This was just a month ago. He had the opportunity to drop us a hint of what they were working on, but nothing. Zippo. A few well-chosen words would have excited the market and the faithful. But nothing. Any improvements are left to speculation. What we do know is that they've been working on the time of flight focus system for Micro Four Thirds, improving low light performance, improving detail, and working on new lenses. But we'll have to wait until late summer to find out more. We'll get new lenses this year, but 
many have been vocal about bringing the L mount to the Micro Four Thirds segment. Nikon and Canon share the mount between the APS-C and full frame. So why not do the same for Micro Four Thirds? Yamani had an answer for that too. He said, We understand this request and we seriously considered the issue when we developed our full frame cameras to offer a unified mount for full frame and Micro Four Thirds sensors. But we decided not to do it because we think it wouldn't bring additional value to our users. Yamani's confident that we'll see growth in the full size hybrid camera market, but understands the huge challenge they face with the economic downturn and the ability to produce product. Yamani addresses this saying, we have a production site in China, but near the eastern coast towards Taiwan, so the impact is not as great as other cities. 80% of the employees have already returned to the factory, but some suppliers still have difficulties. In these circumstances, we're trying to minimize the damage. Camera factories in China are starting to operate right now. This lines up with what we've heard from Sony and Canon in their recent financial statements. Factories are up and running, but the supply chain is still in a state of disruption. We'll get product, but it's going to be delayed. Panasonic gave us the bold and powerful S-Series early last year. They finished off the year with the powerful S1H, a truly powerful full-frame 6K video-centric camera with terrific dynamic range, low light performance, and video quality. It's an absolute powerhouse. It blurs the line between hybrid and cinema cameras. The only issue is the continued use of depth from defocus contrast detect autofocus system. It's not reliable or trustworthy enough to rely on. It doesn't take away from the camera's ability as Daniel would tell us. This is a camera where the use of manual focus should be employed for best results and it has the technology to facilitate this very well. I love reliable autofocus, trustworthy autofocus, but that doesn't mean we should turn our noses up at manual focus. Manual focus gives us complete control with the tools like zebras and focus peaking to produce excellent results. But for the upcoming GH6, I'm hoping with fingers crossed that Panasonic finally releases its time of flight autofocus. This was the biggest issue for many consumers. The GH6 would simply fly off the shelves, making it the perfect camera for a vast segment of filmmakers. Once it's been perfected in the Micro Four Thirds, we could see it come to the next S-Series iteration. Replace the contrast detect autofocus with time of flight and we'll have a solid camera for run and gun work. It's not hard to pull focus manually, I agree, especially with the S1H, but it's one more thing to concentrate on. One more thing to take my mind off the subject. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section down below. In this episode of Behind the Scenes, I want to tell you a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes when it comes to recording revenue, how you get revenue, how much it is, how much effort it takes to get it. I've been producing videos now for going on almost seven months now. It's been six months of producing videos. After two and a half months, I was monetized. So that meant every time a video played, while the video's on, at the beginning or at the end, as long as you didn't close that video, I would get some small amount. Now, it wasn't a whole lot, but once you multiply that by thousands of views, it certainly adds up. In my first month, I got 169 US dollars. The second month, 229. And it's been going up steadily each month to where this month I'm looking at around between 800 and 900 dollars. And I think that's quite a lot. Mostly because it's May, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of news coming out, and it's being hyped up by the most anticipated camera in, well, I can't remember a camera that's been an as anticipated as the R5. That's the first line of revenue that you generally get when you start up a channel. As soon as you get monetized, it, the money will start flowing in. It's that simple. The next line of revenue, and this is something I've just really been, well, I was made aware of it about three months ago when I set up an affiliates link application or program with Amazon. And how this works is, if you look at those links I have in the description down below for the S1 or for some of the kit gear that I use to produce this film, if you clicked on those links and it took you to Amazon, I wouldn't get any money at all. But if you bought something, I would get a certain percentage of that. Now, for each purchase, I will get a lot more than I would for an ad play. How much more? Well, that depends. I was talking to Peter Gregg today and he told me that you can actually make just as much money through affiliate links as you can through the ad revenue. And I've been doing nothing with affiliate links. I set up an affiliate links with Amazon probably about three months ago. Actually, it is three months ago because I got an email from them today telling me that I've got 
three months left to go. And if I don't reach that minimum level, of which I couldn't figure out what it was, but I don't really care because with only $5 off one purchase, it doesn't really matter. It's insignificant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take advantage of this. So what I'm going to do in my new videos, as I produce new videos, in the links section, I'm also going to choose or provide links to gear gear related to the topic of conversation. So for example, this video will have links to the S1, S1H, S1R, and there's a sale on the S1 right now, but as well as the gear that I use, the lights, the stands, uh, the teleprompter, that kind of stuff will also be in it. And what I'm curious to see is, can I make a decent amount of revenue off the affiliate links? Because it's gotta be one of the most easiest things to set up. For this video, it took me about five minutes to locate the gear, put the links in the description, that's it. Whereas to get the revenue for ads, well, it took hours to research and put together the video and publish it. So if you do have a channel, if you are starting out, sure, spend a few months, get all that stuff that you need to get done, but do not forget the affiliate links. It's gotta be one of the most easiest ways to get revenue with the least amount of effort. And the third option is through merchandising and the merchandising revenue can be fed through YouTube. Casey, Casey's channel, Camera Conspiracies, he has t-shirts that he has for sale. G Gerald Undone also has t-shirts. And if you buy one of those t-shirts through his site, well, that revenue comes in through merchandising. So that's another option. And there is a fourth option. And when you get really big, then you have companies willing to advertise with you uh, to provide you money that way. And I haven't even got to that point. I probably would, I think you have to get well beyond 100,000 views for that to even be worth considering. For the ordinary filmmaker, for the ordinary YouTuber, somebody who's looking at getting started, sure, yes, you've got that revenue from ads, but don't forget those affiliate links. So for camera stuff, affiliate links with Amazon and B&H, at least. Uh, if you're doing other stuff, well, then Amazon and then whatever manufacturers or uh, retailers, wholesalers that have a, an affiliates link program. So definitely look into that. It's really, really <laughs> beneficial. Like I said, it can be as much as 50% 50, 50 of the revenue you get each month. So that's it for today. If you guys have any questions about revenue generating or uh, the different uh, streams or how it works or anything like that. So all the gear I talked about in this video, as well as the gear that I use to produce this channel, can be found in the comment section down below under gear. And like I said, there is a link to the S1 for, well, it's about $500 off right now. But that's it for today. This is my last video, unless of course something happens with the R5, knock on wood. It, I've had news come up as late as midnight, so who knows? But thanks for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box, show more box, or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.